much, Joey. And welcome, everybody, to the second annual AI Now Symposium. It is fantastic to see you all here. My name is Kate Crawford. I'm going to be your co-chair for tonight. We have put together a packed program of incredible speakers. And we're also going to make a small announcement of our own, but more on that later. The guiding question for tonight is, how will artificial intelligence become part of our lives? And this is not the stuff of the far off future. This is already happening. AI is being embedded in banal back-end systems and being incorporated into our core social institutions. It's influencing everything from the news you read through to who gets released from jail. And frankly, these effects just aren't very well understood yet. So, what do we even mean when we say artificial intelligence? Because AI has a long history, and that definition has changed every few years. But if we go back to 1956, when a small group of scholars got together in Dartmouth and said, let's do a summer project. Let's create intelligent machines. All right, that was ambitious. Here we are 60 years later, and we're still trying. And the field has had some extraordinary leaps and bounds, but it's also had some very real dead ends. But three things have caused this field to accelerate in just the last decade. Huge amounts of computational power, lots of data, and better algorithms. So these days, when people talk about AI, they're actually talking about a grab bag of techniques, or sometimes they're talking about this film, but often they're talking about a grab bag of techniques. I'm talking here about machine vision, neural networks, natural language processing, and all of these approaches learn about the world by ingesting large amounts of data. So if you did see this film, you might remember that the AI system learns about the personality of its owner by reading all of his email. So now imagine an AI system learning by ingesting all of the Facebook trolling or all of that stop and frisk data with all of those skews and biases intact. So the next decade of AI development is going to present challenges that go far beyond the technical. It is going to implicate our core legal, economic, and social fabrics. So there's a lot at stake tonight to talk about. So to set the scene, for the next 10 minutes, my co-chair, Meredith, and I are going to give you an incredibly high-speed tour through what's happening in AI, why these topics tonight, that is bias, governance gaps under Trump, and finally rights and liberties, and why these particular topics are so important right now. And to give you a sense of how rapidly these social impacts are being felt, I'm going to restrict myself just to examples from the last year. So, the first topic tonight is bias in AI. And personally, as a researcher working in this domain, I've been incredibly thrilled to see a lot of progress has been made in just the last year. We've had some important papers show significant gender biases that have been embedded in the models that do natural language processing. So an NLP model might associate, for example, woman to nurse and man to doctor. But while we're starting to see more computer scientists get interested in this topic of fairness and bias, which is fantastic, there are very real disagreements about what we can do about it and how we might address this problem. But how we respond is going to matter, because these models could have serious unintended impacts. Now, one paper in particular got a lot of negative press, and it was this one. It claimed to have created an automatic criminality detector. It could tell if you were going to be a criminal based on nothing more than your headshot. Well, the researchers said that any resemblance to the phrenology or eugenics of the 19th century is purely accidental, totally accidental, because machine learning is neutral. Well. Hmm. We're going to hear a lot of skepticism about that particular claim from the people on the panels tonight. Because even the earliest pioneers of artificial intelligence were concerned about this myth of neutrality and about bias. This is Joseph Weizenbaum. He invented Eliza. She was the first ever chatbot, and she was invented right here at MIT in 1964. And this chatbot was a hit. It was a huge hit. And maybe because of that, Joseph Weizenbaum was deeply worried about what he described as the essentially deeply powerful delusional thinking, his words, about the way that we are pretending to just accept what an AI system will tell us it's deciding. Now, this phenomenon now has a name. 
It's called automation bias. And it's when people will just accept a decision from an automated system much more than from a human because they assume that it's somehow more neutral or objective. And this has been evidenced in intensive care units, in nuclear power plants, and now in an important study this year, it could also be affecting the judicial system through algorithmic scoring. Another example of automation bias in action came through this report from RAND, which took a year to study the predictive policing system in Chicago. And after doing a very in-depth study, they showed that this system had zero impact in reducing violent crime. But it did have one achievement. It managed to massively increase the amount of harassment of the people who were on the hate list. So just as Joseph Weizenbaum feared, we are starting to rely on these systems even as they are failing us. And we need to do a lot better. So also on this topic of predictive policing and bias, this is one of my favorite interventions of the year. It is the white collar crime app that's made by New Inquiry and it's just as good as it sounds. Um, it basically reverses who is typically visible in predictive policing data by focusing just on the rich and powerful. So basically what they did is they mapped all of the financial crime data from FINRA against all of the neighborhoods of the US. So you can see here that I put in Boston and, you know, right now, up in Cambridge, we're doing okay. There's a few red spots, but anyone here going to downtown financial district, you guys are going into a hotbed of crime. Check it out. That's, that's something you should be worrying about. Finally, the AI field is starting to confront the sticky question of its own bias. And I've been really heartened to see new initiatives by people like Fei Fei Li and AI for All, which are directly trying to address inclusion for women and people of color in AI development. And this is something that our panel will be addressing tonight with the acknowledgement that we have a very long way to go. So now let's quickly turn to the second topic tonight, governance gaps under Trump. And this is a moment for some real talk from us. Because Meredith and I, at around this time last year, hosted the first AI Now Symposium in collaboration with Obama's White House and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And this was part of a big initiative by the administration to develop cutting edge policy around AI. That process has stalled. OSTP is no longer actively engaged in AI policy, nor much of anything if you actually believe their website. And the other parts of the administration, let's be honest, are not picking up the slack. The uh, Treasury Secretary quite recently said that the impact of AI and automation on labor, not even on his radar. So, we have a very different political scene to deal with this year, and I think it provides quite a stark background for some of the topics that we'll be discussing tonight. But the lack of a reality-based agenda for AI doesn't mean that AI isn't impacting politics. So Cambridge Analytica, probably several of you have heard about them, they're a very controversial data firm that offers to manipulate audience behavior, and they claim to have this massive set of individual profiles on 220 million Americans. So basically all of us, and depending who you believe, they may have played a role in both the Trump election, and Brexit. So we have cause for concern. But now the calls for accountability are coming from inside the House. Now we heard actually at the ACM Turing Awards, which are a little bit like the Oscars, but for computer science, Ben Schneiderman made a call for a national algorithmic safety board, which would monitor and assess AI's impacts on our social systems. And these impacts are going to be complex. At a time of rising wealth inequality, researchers are now noticing a new tension in geopolitical power. The global north are rapidly becoming the AI haves, while the global south are becoming the AI have-nots. And this is going to create a very serious imbalance that we're going to need to think about in terms of how we start framing governance and policy, which our panel of senior leaders is going to be discussing with you tonight. And on that thought, I'm going to pass to my co-chair, Meredith Whitaker, to fill you in on what to expect for the final panel of the night. Thank you, Kate. So, so, and thank you all. Great. To set the scene for rights and liberties, which is the topic that will take us out tonight, cast your mind back to just a month ago when Dubai's first robocop reported for duty complete with facial recognition to ID anyone it sees. This is the first of many, 
If all goes according to plan, by 2030, 25% of Dubai's police force will be robots. And U.S. law enforcement is not far behind. We're seeing a marked increase in the use of AI technologies like computer vision, mobile sensing, and machine learning. The Department of Homeland Security is offering prize money now to anyone who can help improve the algorithm TSA uses to detect threats under clothing. That's hashtag interesting training data set. Um, <laughs> At the same time, the director of national intelligence, this is who oversees the nation's spy agencies, have a contest of their own looking for the most accurate facial recognition algorithm. But I don't want to give the impression that this is all contests and aspirations. These systems are already being built into the core of our government. Palantir, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is building a massive machine learning platform for ICE. This will allow 10,000 agents at a time to access millions of pe people's sensitive information, including where they live, who they work for, who their friends are, and their biometric data. This could be a powerful engine for mass deportation in the US. Meanwhile, at a local level, Taser, the company that makes stun guns and police surveillance equipment, is, it has currently renamed themselves Axon and recently rebranded as an AI company. They're busy adding facial recognition to police body cameras that will ID anyone who comes in contact with a cop. Meanwhile, this is at a time where more than half of the US adult population already has their image in a law enforcement database, many of whom have never committed a crime. So what rights to due process will people have when facing systems that can pull up their record before they've been even considered a suspect? Offering a bit of hope here, the judicial system is recognizing the need for accountability. Just this May, a judge in Texas ruled that teachers do have a due process right to contest performance reviews made by algorithms. This is going to be a big case to watch, especially as it intersects with tricky policy and research questions around AI explainability and bias. Now, of course, labor and automation also have significant impacts on rights and liberties. We've all heard the stories about robots replacing human workers, like, say, the one about Amazon, who is scrambling right now to automate everything from forklifts to delivery workers to truckers, trucking being one of the most common jobs in the US. And we need to note that this is coming at a time when low-wage workers are organizing for better working conditions and higher wages in campaigns like Fight for 15. So this raises really tough questions about the future of labor rights. Of course, the story of AI and labor is more complicated than find, replace, human, robot. AI is also augmenting workers and judging them, being used to decide who to hire, who to fire, and who gets promoted. Most recent in research indicates that within five years, a full 80% of US companies will be using AI for performance reviews and hiring. So pause for a moment and think about the implications of bias embedded there. In addition, AI systems are changing the way we work and often without our really knowing it. This is what was happening at Uber, who were using their vast data troves combined with behavioral economic models to nudge workers into working longer hours. And, and here you see a very crisp example of the power that a centralized platform can have when it can see and control worker data down to the individual level. So for our final panel of the night, we have leaders from industry, academia, and civil society who will discuss the rights and liberties implications of AI as it's woven through our social and economic institutions. Now, okay, we just presented you with a rapid series of AI-related changes. And remember, all of these stories happened in the last year alone. So what's to be done? Speaking personally for a moment, my background is in large-scale measurement designing measurement and analysis pl platforms to better understand complex systems. So when I look at these problems, I see a measurement challenge. AI is weaving its way through everything, and yet we know so little about its impacts. And of course, before we know, we need to measure. And I'm not talking about the kind of measurement where you instrument a server to collect another variable, although that may be useful here as well. I'm talking about drawing on diverse methods from across disciplines to create a shared understanding of AI's powerful effects. Which leads me to our big announcement. 
Kate Crawford is not only my co-chair, she is my co-founder, and we are launching the AI Now Initiative. This is a new research center based in New York that will be dedicated to empirical research across four key domains. These are bias and machine learning, labor change and automation, the effects of AI in our critical infrastructures, and of course, how AI is impacting our basic rights and liberties. We'll be inviting academics, researchers, AI developers, and advocates to join us in addressing these. And we are delighted to let you know that the ACLU is coming on board as our first partner. They are committed to mapping the effects of advanced computation on civil rights. Yeah. Thank you. So watch this space, and please join us. It's this community here tonight who are doing this essential and urgent work. We want to support it, and we want to join you to build a field together that can understand and map the social impacts of AI. Wow.